Thank you very much. Welcome to the afternoon session. Um, I'm very pleased that um, we have such a full um, audience. The, the room is full. I'm sure you will learn some new things uh, from this talk. A very few words about myself, not, not to take you um, too long with uh, that. I'm developing large-scale web applications for the past 13 years on the LAMP stack since the LAMP stack wasn't uh, such a cool player in the enterprise world and um, people were kind of dismissing it for uh, not being as uh, professional as Java, for example. In the past 10 years, I've been migrating from the backend development role to DevOps, um, which is very close to my heart. And then um, I started doing architecture consultancy, and I also started a PHP group in uh, Cluj-Napoca, my uh, hometown. Uh, more, more on the actual project, the um, customer for which uh, we were uh, delivering this application is a low-cost airline, uh, very similar to Ryanair or EasyJet. Don't let this um, <coughs> fool you. Uh, they are by no means a small company. They are, in fact, a very large company judged by European standards. And um, in 2015, they have been one of the top three most perform profitable airlines in the world. And they have a record streak of more than 44 consecutive profitable quarters, which is a very impressive thing um, for a company. <coughs> By linking more than, uh, I'm sorry, uh, their strategy is to connect touristic destinations with underserved U.S. cities, therefore creating a market. Um, instead of um, cannibalizing from the existing market, they bring new customers in and they fly them to touristic destinations. So they don't even have competition on more than 90% of the routes they are serving. A very particular aspect of um, this airline, as compared to others, is that they don't use a GDS. Maybe you know um, GDS are global distribution systems that, um, like Worldspan or Sabre, Amadeus, maybe these names sound familiar. Most of the major players in the airline industry um, delegate the responsibility of, um, of their availability to somebody else, a GDS. And this customer doesn't do that. They have their own reservation engine and uh, deliver information <coughs> based on that one. In order to sell tickets, they don't use um, any other mean than their own website platform. And additionally, they offer a call center facility where you can pick up the phone and make reservation over the phone, the person on the other line, end of the uh, line will just follow the same booking process as you would yourself on the website. It helps a lot of people. It's um, uh, quite, um, uh, quite heavy traffic as well. I have a very brief schema of um, representing the data flows in the legacy application. So a couple of years ago, when we were tasked with, uh, tasked with this project, um, uh, they had a back office interface where they were administering all the information, pushing it to the um, data layer. And um, the only customers for this data were the web reservation portal and the call center application that I explained earlier. This schema is only here to serve uh, for showing the concepts. It's by no means a complete diagram of how the legacy application was looking like when we, um, when we were tasked to uh, refactor it. What I wanted to uh, see in this diagram is also the different types of data that live in the data layer. First of all, there are the reservations that have already happened. And for some of them, you have to make an online check-in. But it's the historical data, basically. The second type of information is the availability information, where you tell people if there are more uh, flights available and uh, what the prices are. 
It's a very complex pricing scheme for flights. It's not like the normal uh, pricing for products where you just put a number. Mm, they go in batches of uh, tickets, and it also depends on the moment, um, how long uh, are you making the reservation before the actual flight, and the price changes. So a lot of complex rules on that end. The third type of data is the static one. So all kind of information about the flight itself, but also about the additional upsell products that this company is selling are static data. We will talk a little bit more about this particular one later. When we were tasked with this project, the main requirement from the customer was to enable an end user to purchase a full travel experience based on the destination. So instead of just selling cheap plane tickets as they are a low cost carrier, they sell a lot of other things centered around the destination. So imagine you want to uh, take a weekend trip, you do purchase the plane tickets, but you also have to reserve a hotel and maybe rent a car in the United States is um, quite common to, to do that. And um, maybe over the weekend, you want to spend some time at uh, some local um, attractions. So they also sell tickets for those. What were the constraints that our customer imposed on the solution? <coughs> the in-house reservations engine is written in Java, and they keep it internally, so the Java team is located on the customer premises. We were tasked to uh, recreate the web-facing part using a LAMP stack. You know, when you have a polyglot technology stack, things are not as smooth as in the normal cases when you just have the same things over and over again, like the traditional PHP and MySQL and everything. It's much more complex, and the interactions between the different teams and the different skill sets required a large amount of communication that everybody needed to handle the Second very important thing was that the customer was located um, on the Pacific time zone and our developers were in the UK and in Romania. So stretching over 10 time zones um, in terms of communication for a team, it's not the most simple thing that uh, you can do. And it was a real challenge. We were basically a non-stop shop of developers. It was a very great ride, to be honest. Mm, but we developed some mechanisms that I will show a little bit later as well to overcome um, working too much on a different time zone than the one uh, we are living in. And of course, the other constraint was to completely replace the <coughs> monolithic application that the customer initially had. The IT change was planned over a span of several years, but the web-facing part was quite critical because the website, card, our website already had problems when there were large traffic spikes. So our deadline wasn't a couple of years. It was one calendar year until next Cyber Monday. We had to be up and running with everything, with the complete user experience. So how did we divide the calendar year into several milestones? You can't do uh, just one single delivery. First, we tackled the booking path, meaning you start from the customer choosing the departure and destination airport and do all the upselling until the payment moment and the booking confirmation. That was the first milestone. The second one was um, to implement the online check-in experience, which is a much smaller one, but also allows upsells of different products. So if you didn't buy a rental car initially, maybe you want to change your mind and buy it the second time during online check-in. Our third milestone was completely dedicated to performance testing and tuning. So in preparation for Cyber Monday, we ran different tests and tuned all the systems that we already had working and run 
automated test zone. I will show you a little bit about the technology stack. It wasn't a very simple thing to um, try to explain and put it in a diagram. I will try uh, to explain as much as I can. But feel free to ask any questions. Uh, so interrupt me and ask me something if it's uh, not very clear. The data itself, with the three <coughs> kinds of um, data availability, existing reservations and static data, is um, sitting on, on the bottom. The only items accessing this data um, were a, a layer of Java services, which are transactional by nature. But what they do is that they fence the access to the actual database, because if we wanted later to, and we did, to improve the underlying data structures, we could do that and not modify anything on top of it. The Java services, which represent the actual booking engine written in-house, can be consumed by different clients, let's call them clients. The web-facing part is the very <coughs> high traffic that we needed to isolate, and actually this was our delivery, the, the web-facing uh, applications but they could also be consumed by internal applications. I show them here as third party in, in the lack of a better name. So on the web facing bits, how did we actually do it? We wrote a thin layer of PHP services on top of the reservations engine. Why do I call it a thin layer? Well, because it has a very small JSON footprint. So the communication uh, in and out of those PHP services need to be very tiny in order to make it performant for its clients. Its clients are JavaScript single page applications that serve the different purposes. So if you are going through the booking path, you have one single page application if you're going to do an online check-in, there's a second um, single page application <coughs> and so on. The back office you know, can be done in any other technology, but all of them will consume the same layer of PHP services. Maybe you are wondering why choose a single page application. If you have PHP developers in house, can't they just deliver some HTML front end on top of the services? Well, the problem with the web-facing applications is that they need to be really fast. But you can't measure fast. So you work on the perceived performance of your application by delivering a single page application that is loaded once in the client browser, and then communicate with the PHP layer based on those very small JSON footprints. And for the user, everything will appear as if it was working very fast. Even if the SPA may be a bit heavier, the customer doesn't feel it because they only load this thing <coughs> once. Another question I received when I delivered this talk in uh, much smaller groups was, why do we need all this complexity? What is it good for? Well, in the time frame of one year, we didn't even have one year for delivering the, um, the actual functionality. We need to work in parallel. So if you task a team to deliver the PHP services, you can task another team to deliver the single page applications, and they can work in parallel. So you effectively double your speed of development and deliver the full functional product in the end. There are some security aspects that we needed to handle because 
of the call center required user authentication and it could, uh, the application itself could only be accessed from the uh, VPN, from the client premises. So in order to skip implementing user logins and authentications and permissions, we went to something already on the market that does this extremely well. And this is the family of products known as a CMS. So CMSs do manage content. They are content management systems. But before you get to manage the content, you have to have all the user authentication in place. So you just selected the CMS, not, not the best option, but um, the, the one that got us faster, fastest in the market. We chose Drupal as a CMS. I know it's not ideal, but it worked. And um, it was much easier to secure than other CMSs. So uh, we actually balanced the choice between perfect code and time to market. So in all these technology items, that I mentioned, where exactly do they live? And how do you make them communicate with each other? We introduced the architectural notion of a silo. I will explain you uh, very, uh, in a very simplistic way what the silo is. We took each and every application and prepared a server for it. So the Drupal was packaged with a JavaScript single page application and deployed on one machine. The Symfony services were packed and deployed on another machine. And then the cache was kept separate because access to it needed to be configured differently. And if you put all of these things together, you get like three machines, which is obviously not the case. If you want a scalable architecture, you put multiple front-end machines and multiple back-end machines. And we actually did some performance testing. How many front-end boxes do we need? How many back-end boxes do we need? And when we obtained the number that delivered the end-to-end -end functionality, respecting the service level agreement, we said, OK, all these machines represent a silo. Why only a silo? because now you can go and scale everything horizontally. So you put the full application in one silo, let's say it takes 10 machines in after measurements in one scenario, and then you raise another silo of 10 machines and another silo of 10 machines on demand. If you don't need it, you don't <coughs> make all the setup. You can't achieve these things manually, so we do have a great DevOps team that automated all of these things with uh, Ansible. So I strongly recommend uh, you do the same. If you don't have DevOps uh, skills in-house, try to get some. They are very, very good. I, I want to explain a little bit how we do the upgrades of the software. It, it's not very intuitive, but once you get it, you will definitely like it. There, is, there was one hard requirement. You can't have the website down at all. So not like at night for one minute. No, you can't have it offline. So what do you do? You take one silo down and have the F5 load balancer serve the website using the remaining one or two silos. You try, uh, route all the traffic in there. And in the first silo, you do the upgrade. So you put all the new code and all the new functionality. And then declare it as live for the F5 load balancer. And then slowly, traffic will be routed to it. So all of a sudden, you have the old application and the new application running at the same time without anybody noticing that you have done an upgrade. 
and then you take the second silo down and upgrade that one as well. And let's say things go wrong, you still have the website running because you made the upgrade on the first silo. So even if it's not intuitive, it's very powerful. You have to use session stickiness for this. So you have to tell F5 that once a session is open for a specific silo, it has to keep all the next requests from that user inside the silo because you want the same version of the application to be served to that user. So taking a silo down is not instantaneous. You have to wait for the sessions to drain out all the users to finish what they were doing on the website. It takes 10 minutes maybe, but only when nobody is uh, interacting with that silo, you can take it down. Can you spot an additional benefit other than keeping um, the actual application live all the time? What else can you do with so many silos and uh, different versions of the same software? Testing. Awesome, that's exactly what we did. And the uh, marketing was really happy that they got this for free. What did you say? We couldn't hear you in the other room. The answer was? A-B testing. I thought it was going to be A-B testing. A-B, thank you, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I promise this will get more technical. It's now all architecture and a lot of words, and uh, maybe it's, it's not very fun. In the beginning, I mentioned you that one of the types of uh, data is the static data. So basically, we asked ourselves, why go through all the trouble of setting so many items and uh, stacks? If every time you need to show something on the user screen, you have to go inside and hit the database, what's the point? So of course, the answer is caching. How, how did we use caching in this particular setup? We took the static data out of the bottom layer and promoted uh, much upper in the hierarchy. Actually, the um, PHP services that mm, consume this cache and maintain it because somebody also has to populate it with information. We're very happy that they didn't have to go through the Java stack at all. Imagine you want to show one of the hotels that uh, you want to let people stay in. You can't get the hotel name and the hotel description and the image every time from the database or from the file system. It's not going to work. So our technical solution for caching was Varnish. Varnish is a very powerful workhorse and it delivered very, very good things. All of our static information was being pre-calculated when deploying a new silo with a new version of the application. We also prefetched all the information in cache so then everybody coming and asking for data, they were instantly hitting Varnish. This also added to the total deployment time, so you can't do these things by magic. You have to uh, take time to go and uh, populate also the cache, and not only wait for the sessions to drain out of a silo. And by bringing it so close to the client browser, we were also able to have the single page applications make requests directly to the cache. So not even go from JavaScript to PHP and then to Varnish, they went uh, directly. I will show you immediately a more uh, clear diagram on how that happens. So. The silo is just a generic concept, right? A bunch of servers with different uh, targets. Some of them are doing the front end, the others the back end. But what exactly do we put in a silo? 
First of all, we use varnish as a dispatcher mechanism and hide all the interactions with the silo behind varnish. The Drupal and single page applications uh, are one box right each, so front end boxes. The symphony machines are the back end boxes. Then you have memcache for sessions because sessions in the database are so slow every time. And then the static data, which we completely separated from memcache. So static data was file system based and varnish communicating to the static data um, was much faster because then it could already cache all the static information straight in varnish. So imagine a call center agent receives a phone call and logs in. Once they do this, they hit varnish, which then routes the request to the front end box. They perform the authentication, right? Come with their username and password. And then the single page application written in JavaScript is the only one interacting any further the customer on the other end of the phone line um, asks for a specific route and some dates, they make the search. But um, once this happens, so once you select the destination and the time frame, you can immediately cache even availability information and promote it to memcache. So then the user will get all the information almost for free, even if it's very dynamic information like availability, which is subject to change every couple of seconds. So how do you populate the cache? You pick the actual availability information from the Java layer, so subsequently from the database, and enrich it with the static data. So you put in the hotel name and the hotel description and everything. You <coughs> add this information and then write the destination JSON in memcache. All the further requests will go and hit varnish and memcache directly. This is very fast and very powerful. I will not tell you numbers because I'm not a big believer in statistics. So I. I won't tell you how many times this improved the actual user experience, but it improved it by a lot. Okay, so this was the very dry architecture bit. What about the developers, right? We said the development team was spread over 10 time zones, and it's not really funny to have to work in the middle of the night. So what we collocated were the actual teams doing either front-end or back-end services. So each team was collocated, and the way these teams communicated were through fixtures. So we upfront went and wrote all the contracts between various layers of the application. Each of the components can be seen as a black box if you want. So you just write the JSONs that um, go in and the ones that go out, and then the front end guys can just go and code against those features, write their own automated test suite independently. They just hope the back end guys will respect these contracts, and the back end guys mm, go and pick the fixtures and work in order to implement that functionality. The same goes for the Java layer. So all of these separations were very strict and it, it really helped us work in parallel at, at normal, decent uh, times during the day. So if we are to summarize what fixture-based development looks like, basically it enforces discussing contracts beforehand. So you have two types of um, items that you need to discuss the happy flow, when everything goes fine, this is how the information will look like. And then you go through the negative scenarios, like what if something is not available, 
What if the data in the cache has expired? What if something else happens? All of these things are at least thought in advance and planned accordingly. So you, you can view how your next week or couple of weeks will look like, which is quite awesome if you ask any manager. Another thing that really helped us was that every developer could run their own part of the application or the individual machine. The, the total setup is very complex and nobody will really want to run it on a single laptop. So the independence that uh, Fixtures offered the, our developers was very appreciated. And of course, the possibility to test independently each component is quite an added bonus. Yeah. This will get even funnier. So, does anybody know what 204 means? No content. No content. Okay. We have an answer from here. So, you are very right. The 204 is actually an HTTP status code. It represents a success code saying mm, that everything went fine, but it doesn't offer anything in return. So the specific bit about 204 is that the actual content that it is transmitted back as a response is a zero. You can't put anything in the response of a 204 request. The response, I mean. So why is this a trick? And what do you actually do with it? Well, the backend says, okay, I received your request, thank you very much. It can validate the request, and if it's not valid, it will return, of course, a different status code. But if everything is okay, you just, in the backend, you go and continue doing the work, the actual processing, maybe it's heavier. And the client, basically the JavaScript application, can continue doing other things like loading images and offering the user the perceived speed. So I just put together a diagram to show you a little bit how this is happening. Let's say the user come in, comes in with this search for uh, flights for tomorrow. It will hit Drupal because that's the front layer and Drupal will just post the search data to the thin layer of PHP services, which will immediately validate it and return a 204 no content saying, thank you, I received this request. I will go and um, deliver it. So what happens here is that the Symfony layer will perform the actual flight search in the Java layer and will get all the availability information straight from the oven. So this is not cached information, but it will put all the data imme immediately into memcache. So all the next steps of a user journey will happen only discussing with memcache. You don't need to go to Java layer anymore and fetch heavy data. So Drupal, after receiving the success code, will go and initialize the JavaScript single application with all the information about the search, about the user, and will update the UI to the next step so the user will see something is happening while the backend layer still fetches the data and writes it into memcache. And then the UI <coughs> will constantly pull memcache. Do you have data for me yet? Do you have any new information about this search. And once the flight information is there, which is usually almost immediately, so the user doesn't th see this, it will just fetch the flights and show them on the user screen. But this particular way of doing things allows you to have a fallback mechanism in case the Java services go slower and the user still sees that something is happening in their user interface, 
and eventually the flights will arrive and will be displayed on the screen. Another place where we used the 204 trick was not in the front end, but in the back end. When doing very large batch processing, we discovered that um, the same trick can apply. So, of course, you go and check for permissions. Is the person calling this method allowed to do this operation? Get the request and validate it. And if everything goes okay, the batch processing can start. But first of all, we just return a tool for no content and then go and work on all the items. And the colleague is non-blocking in this moment, which is quite important. So how do you actually implement this in PHP? Just because it's a PHP conference, we, we can't go without showing some, some of the meat. It's very simple. You put the header uh, specifying the, the tool for no content. And you must say that content length is true and not return anything. And just do flush or will be flush, depends on what, you, what your code is. We did it in Symfony. So in Symfony, there is a very nice class. It's called Streamed Response, which helps you implement this. You set the uh, status code, 204 at the closing connection header, and then you place an empty callback function in the response. Oh. Like this. A mandatory step that is sometimes um, skipped and prone to bugs is uh, the preparation of the response that needs to be compliant with the HTTP specification, and then you just send it over the wire. The really interesting part is the callback function that does nothing in this case. So if you want to implement the same thing, but with a different status code, and you want to actually return items, data, you just, instead of doing nothing, you just write the normal implementation. Okay, so this event, um, I told you that we used the 204 for a backend application um, that we used internally. It's an event logging system. So imagine all of these machines with different purposes have to log data and you can't go and read the application log of each machine when something goes wrong. So you just get an event logging system that is throwing all the log into the same place, so we can actually search for it. Using the uh, 204 mechanism, you can send information even from the front end and also from the back end components. They just throw data in the log, and because they get the 204 no content, they can quickly go and process the rest of the information. Something like this. You just send data to be logged, and then the 204 no content comes back and then the actual processing can take place independently. So I have two screenshots from our internal application. Mm, this is how it looks like. We tagged every component. You see Drupal, Symfony, Rust Web is the Java layer and the JavaScript single page application. We color coded them to be able to find things faster. And you can immediately see how long each request took and how long each service actually worked. And if you zoom in on one of these uh, things, you can see the events, the start and the end event, and the dates. You can even, um, in the latest version of the application, you can even go inside <laughs> and see the uh, request and the uh, responses straight from this timeline. I will have to go a little bit faster. Uh, next topic on the um, lessons learned um, was error handling. 
So after talking about the architecture and the tool for trick, the next thing is how did we discuss the contracts for fixtures outside of the happy flow? So the happy flow is something that everybody jumps to implement, but uh, when it comes to handling errors, um, things need to be uh, discussed a bit further. So we split the errors into two types. The recoverable ones, which the application can um, actually come back um, and serve the user for the same search. So let's say that uh, the user selects a hotel which is no longer available. You return the user to the hotel choosing page and say, this is no longer available, please select a different hotel. This is a recoverable error. But um, non-recoverable error is uh, when something goes really bad. So we used four XX status codes for all the recoverable errors. Conflict was uh, specifically used for the case when two people wanted to book the same seat on the plane. You had a conflict, but you didn't know until uh, both of them got to the end of the booking path. One of them did purchase the seat, and the other one got the 409 conflict, and we instructed the user interface what was the step that needed to be um, displayed to the user when they were taken back, so you just don't say, this is, hmm. uh, this seat is taken, just click here to go to the seat selection page. No, you just do this thing inside the JavaScript single page application. And for the actual problems where a server dies or worse, we used five uh, XX status codes. This is quite simple. You don't have many of them. You just say something is completely wrong. We cannot recover your search, your booking. So you have to start all over again. And because of uh, the complexity of the application, not only did we cache a lot of data, but we also needed to execute things in parallel, which is not very trivial in PHP, but it can be done. And um, I'm sure a lot of you have worked with CURL functions to access certain data. There is another side of the uh, story. The multi-curl functions allow you to execute things at the same time. And um, they are quite old. They are, um, I think they have 10 years of implementation, but, but people don't normally know about them. So I encourage you to, um, to have a read and play with them. They are very, very powerful. One thing must be uh, said that when you start executing multiple things in PHP, um, using curl multi specifically, you have to wait for the longest request to finish processing before you move on to the next uh, line code. And um, if you use the 204 mechanism, you can get around that quite easily. And a very short example of how we used this um, actual curl multi in practice. So once the flights were selected, right, you, you make a search for a specific destination for some dates, but then you decide which uh, flights you want to, uh, to pick. And then we were searching in parallels for the available hotels in those time frames for the vehicles, seat map for the two flights that were selected by the user. And when you see products, it's about tickets to various events happening in that destination location in the time frame. All of these were um, executed in parallel, and then all the information about this was specifically tied to the search that the user was making initially, and uh, was placed in Memcache for a very quick access. So then when the user interface was updated to the next step, they could fetch the hotel information straight from Memcache. And I want to quickly um, sum this up, um, that inside of a Symfony service, when we talked about uh, static data, this is how things were happening in real life. So the request, 
comes into the PHP service, and the availability, heavy data coming from Java, is mixed and matched with the static data about the hotel or about the destination, and then the results were cached. A very quick conclusions. I hope I didn't bore you too much. So the first architectural item that we learned by writing the application and thinking about it were the silos, a very powerful concept that um, I strongly recommend you to explore if you have really large applications. It's worth the, the work. Static data being brought as close to the customer as possible allows the actual end user to think that the application is very fast, even if some parts of it are not necessarily as fast as perceived. Fixture-based development helped us uh, overcome the time zone issue and to discipline our teams into writing code that respected certain specifications. I don't like the microservices word, so I, said, I wrote here, delegate responsibility. <coughs> mm, write as small services as possible and um, have a central controller delegate the responsibility to them. In our case, the search for hotels and vehicles and other things. Each of them had a, a very specific purpose that was only dispatched from a tiny piece of code saying, okay, now go and fetch all these things in parallel instead of uh, doing everything in one place. And of course, executing things in parallel is something that really helped our application speed overall. Any questions? Uh, questions around the, um, yeah, sure. How did you handle scaling payments? Um, and did you like work directly with card providers to do that, or is that something that you didn't deal with? Is that more the Java level? Yeah, fortunately, the payments um, were done in the Java layer, and um, during one Cyber Monday, the actual payment provider crashed. So <laughs> after a couple of hours of people buying tickets like crazy, None of the application items died, but the payment provider did. So mm, it really depends on um, how much traffic they can handle. Do you have any like, fair labor for that? Do you have like, a secondary payment provider? No. No, it's an exclusive contract. <laughs> did that answer your question? Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So you sent the request off to the Symphony services using Multicol. The, the item is told that it, you're essentially making a promise that that item's going to come back into memcache. Mm -hmm. How do you instruct that the item is in memcache? Are you, are you using the 204 trick there as well, or are you just returning 404 from memcache to say this item's not available yet, keep trying? Yeah, so um, if I understand your question correctly, is If we are returning 404s in case of, um, I think you have to ask the question again. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. So say you're going to get the seats back. So you send the service to get the seats availability. Mm -hmm. The front end layer has then got a 204 response to say, the back end's doing something, please wait. Is That's that correct okay. in my understanding? The polling mechanism for Memcache um, says something like, okay, go 10 times to Memcache and try to fetch the seats, but if you fail to get them 10 times, this is a non-recoverable error. The booking cannot continue. Or in some other cases, if the tickets for local shows don't show up, that's a recoverable error. We don't necessarily want to sell those. So it, it really depends on the business logic. But the polling mechanism is um, set to retry every couple of seconds. So you wait ten, two seconds, you go to Memcache, say, okay, do we have the data yet? No. Okay, wait then two more seconds, try again. And at some point after, <coughs> I think we eventually set the number to 10, 
uh, but it was obtained through trial and error. Um, it just gave up and said, okay, this is a real problem. We can't continue with the working. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, you know with the upgrades to the system and when you replace one silo with another one, uh, how did you handle the database layer if there was if one silo that you upgraded introduced new functionality that wasn't that was changing the data layer? How did you handle that? Well, the actual Java services. So, so if the new silo was introducing new functionality or new features that required new items in the database or new new structure of the database, but the other silos were still using the previous structure, how did you have that problem, or did you, did you have to? No, actually, it's not a problem because from the Java services, you get the data that you need, but the front end version knows. Uh, what information comes from Java and what not, and it updates itself according to that. So the old version uh, receives uh, the same JSON from Java, and the new version received, uh, receives um, an enhanced JSON and processes that one instead. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. A quick question. Um, you talked about the, the Java Java layer all the way down that was in-house, that you probably weren't the client developing that. Yep. Did you go so far as to write the, uh, what was the word, um, the, sort of the license, the interface piece, you know, what you would expect transactionally from that each time, and how did that work with that team? Yes, so um, that's how we actually started working with fixtures, because we need to develop a common language between um, all these web-facing components and the Java layer. And this is uh, where the first fixtures came from. And then we discovered the actual power of the concept and used um, the same idea in the communication between the web-facing components themselves. More questions in here? They're all smiling in there, but no more questions. Is there any reason why you do not use any queuing technology like RabbitMQ or so? You do all the time consuming uh, work inside a request cycle now. Yes, actually there is a very strong reason. Um, I'm not sure you will like it, but um, the messaging queue creates a single point of failure. You can't have a message queue that has a fallback. So if there's a problem in the <coughs> messaging queue, you lose all the messages already in place, in process. And um, if you go back to older technologies like the ones we used, um, you, you don't have that. So it's better to use simple laps, uh, LAMP stack uh, concepts that allow you to uh, go and scale everything horizontally instead of creating one single point of failure that will eventually bite you in the ass when you least expect it. Okay, so you have thought about it, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, so a question about your silos. Um, Am I understanding it right that you bundled your, uh, your Drupal, your single page application, and your Symfony API all together in one silo? Is that correct? Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, so am I correct in understanding that your silo contains your Drupal code, your single page application, and your um, Symfony yes. API? Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering why you bundled them all three together and why didn't you separate the API out into its own layer so you can load balance it so if you're um, getting lots of hits to your front end you can scale it up and because you got that load balancing and you'll have cache in there as well mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to scale that up so I'm just wondering why you all bundled it all together. It is hidden behind the nature proxy but I didn't add it to the diagram because it would have become more crowded. If you uh, look at the, I have two Drupal and SPA boxes, and those are hidden behind an HA proxy. And then in this diagram, I just showed three Symfony boxes for the backend. They also stay behind an HA proxy, but the actual numbers, how many 
backend boxes you get in one silo were obtained using uh, load testing and real measurements. So the actual shape of a silo it wasn't predetermined. That is why I think uh, this kind of architecture is quite flexible because it allows you to change it even after everything is in production. Okay, so is a silo a collection of boxes? Yes. Okay, cool. More questions? Well, if there are any, any further questions, um, I'll be around the hall, so you can come and ask me even more things. Yeah, lots of smiling faces in the other room, but thank you very much for your job.